Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming to this evening's Center of Korean Studies uh, book launch event. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Kate Heacock from the University of Washington Press, who is uh, the publishers of the book uh, that uh, Bruce and Ju-chan will be, uh, has, has translated and will be introducing. But just wanted to thank Kate for reaching out to us on behalf of Bruce and Ju-chan um, to make this event uh, possible. And I'd also like to thank, uh, of course, Charles Tandier uh, Upsa from our Centers and Institutes Office, uh, who has helped with all the logistical arrangements and who is in the background uh, in case there are any uh, sort of technical glitches. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce, welcome, welcome and introduce our speakers for this evening, uh, Bruce and Chuchan Fulton. Uh, who are a pro prolific and critically acclaimed team of translators of Korean fiction, whose translations have been published in numerous anthologies, literary and academic journals, as well as uh, not only university, but also mainstream publishers. Um, and Bruce is also an associate professor and the Young Bin Min Chair in Korean Literature and Literary Translation at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, it is our great honor and pleasure to have them at this evening's event, uh, where they will be talking about uh, their recent uh, translation publication, uh, a novel by Kim Soon, One Left, which tells the story of Korean comfort women. And so uh, please join me in welcoming Bruce and Ju Chan this evening. So over to you. Thank you very much, Grace. It, one of the, one of the few pleasures, I guess, in this lockdown uh, COVID-19 era is that we get to reconnect with, uh, with colleagues and friends. And I had to check my CV to, uh, to recall the first and, and only previous time I was privileged to visit uh, SOAS. And that was almost six years to the day uh, December 3rd, 2014, I guess it was. So very, very timely indeed. And um, we're, we're very happy to be, uh, to, to, to be part of the SOAS family once again, if only briefly. And uh, we, all, we also would like to uh, thank the University of Washington Press um, Editor-in-Chief Lauren McLaughlin, who, um, Ju Chan will talk about this, but, um, after 32 uh, failed proposals, um, the University of Washington Press made a decision in, uh, in record time, about two weeks or so. So we're, we're very grateful for their support. And uh, we would also like to thank two pioneering scholars of the Korean so-called comfort women, uh, Sarah So and Bonnie Oh, Bonnie Oh in particular, was kind enough to write a forward to the volume. So what we propose to do uh, is for me to focus on the novel itself uh, as a work of literature, uh, the, the literary style that Kim Soon uses, uh, and the importance of, of this novel. It's more, this is more than just a book launch, I would, I would suggest. And then uh, Ju Chan will talk more about Kim Soon, the author, and about the process, the very circuitous process that brought us from translation to publication, because we think it kind of mirrors the, the very larger uh, issue of, um, of, of, of the so-called comfort women. And then we will offer a short bilingual reading from the book, after which I understand we will be available for uh, questions and answers. And this is always a part of a public event that, that we enjoy. So I'd, I'd like to start by uh, relating an, uh, an anecdote. Um, about a month ago, I received, I'm on the mailing list of the IIAS, a, an association of Asian studies based in the Netherlands. And I noticed with interest a feature on human trafficking. And so 
I said, well, great. Uh, one left uh, a, a, the first, the very first Korean novel to focus exclusively on the Korean comfort woman, women of World War II. Perhaps they would uh, like a review copy. I, I, I understand that they have an extensive um, list of book reviews and their publications. And it took a month for me to get an answer, but uh, a couple of days ago, a message came in from a staff member saying, oh, congratulations on your book, but I'm sorry to say we don't review novels. And so uh, after my eyes had stopped rolling, I, I tried to compose a, um, a considered reply in which I suggested that, yes, indeed, One Left is a novel, but it's much more than a novel. It's the very first um, novel written by a Korean about one of the uh, most notorious um, examples of human trafficking in modern Korean history. So um, per perhaps another way to suggest the significance of this novel is to consider its title. So uh, our title is One Left. In Korean, the title is Han Myung, literally one person. And a couple of nights ago, the last meeting of my Asia 457 seminar course at the University of British Columbia. Uh, this is a course on the modern Korean novel. We read one novel a week. The very last novel we, we, we read was One Left. And I asked the class about this. I usually uh, assign them a comment paper to, to begin the, the three hour meeting. And the, the question I posed to them was this. Scholars estimate that some 200,000 girls and young women were taken from their ancestral homes to serve as sex slaves for the Japanese military during the Pacific War. Why then do you believe that author Kim Soom titled her novel one person. And one of the answers I received, and, and this I should mention, this is the this is the finest class of UB students I've, I've been blessed with in my 20 years at UBC. So one of the students said that one person could also be understood as one individual. And he proceeded to remind me of the Middle English and Middle Latin and Latin roots of the word individual, which basically means indivisible. It means a person that cannot be, cannot be taken apart. But being taken apart is precisely what happened to each and every one of these 200,000 girls and young women. And, I'm, and, and we emphasize girls because the protagonist of, of our novel was 13. This would be by the, by the, uh, the traditional count, uh, you're one year old for every day, for every year in which you've lived at least a day. We would understand um, 13 year old as perhaps 12 or even 11 years old when, when she was taken away. So uh, an individual, uh, suddenly dispossessed of her or his ancestral home, dispossessed of her identity, as uh, as as you will see, and uh, basically dispossessed of her humanity and reduced to um, uh, a body which is appropriated by uh, by an institution called war. So. Um, I, I, I go on at some length about this to mention that, um, yes, this is, this is a novel, but it is a novel in a very distinct stream of modern Korean fiction, uh, commonly referred to as Chamyomunak, engaged literature. And this is literature that is engaged with the the common buzzword is Henshu, reality. Uh, but a work such as One Left 
is engaged in the finest sense of the word in terms of um, reclamation, uh, truth and reconciliation, social justice, healing, but uh, we would suggest in, in the recovery of the lives of 200,000 plus individuals and uh, their recovery and their return to historical memory and to the historical record. And uh, that is, is what we consider to be the significance of the book. And we applaud author Kim Soom for being the first author to, uh, to, to, take, to, to take the step of, of writing a, a full-length fictional work about this, this period of Korean history, which uh, still is little known. And, um, and it's especially significant when we consider that of these 200,000 individuals, only 15 or 16 remain alive. So it is, it is very appropriate that their story, their legacy is being returned to historical memory. So uh, another reason that Ju Chan and I undertook this translation is that for the past 15 years or so, we have been involved with trauma literature. And our reasons for being involved with Korean trauma literature uh, have to do not only with its reception in the English speaking world, and uh, all of you have probably heard or perhaps voiced comments about the gloominess of uh, much of modern Korean fiction. It's Urupta, Urwa, oh. Um, but uh, not just as a, uh, as a way of responding to, to, to the reception of modern Korean fiction in English translation, but also, um, and I hope this doesn't sound too presumptuous, but uh, as a as a uh, effort on our part to to promote uh, social justice, truth and reconciliation, healing in, in an increasingly fractured world, and so this uh, impulse led us to to gather the the three stories that appear in our University of Hawaii Press anthology, The Red Room, Stories of Trauma Contemporary Korea, which consists of a novella by Oh Chung Hee, a novella by Im Choru, and a story by Pak Won So. We also translated the very first literary work by Che Yun. Um, there a petal silently falls in our translation, or Chogi, uh, in Korean. And more recently, we have translated a novel involving a torture operative. Uh, this is based on an actual uh, individual who worked in the Jundu Hwan administration. Um, this was Sengong by, by Chen and Young in our translation, The Catcher in the Loft. And uh, also a novel by Kim Sagwa, her first novel, Mina, by an author whom we believe has, uh, has the best understanding of, the, uh, of what has come to be known as Hill Chosun, and particularly as that was manifested in the, in the metropolitan area of Seoul. So, uh, especially in a, in a year such as we have just finished, which has been marked by uh, calls for social justice on many fronts and, and in many parts of the world, it's uh, fortuitous indeed that uh, we were able to find a publisher for, for this novel. It, as, a, as a university instructor, of, of, courses in Korean literature and Korean to English literary translation, I'm always interested in the style that an author brings to her or his subject matter. So uh, a logical question would be, how do you write a novel about 
uh, an event of historical trauma, such as the the, the fate of, uh, of all of these young women who were inducted into sexual servitude. How do you uh, how do you legitimately, responsibly, adequately recreate what they experienced? Uh, a couple of Korean American novelists uh, attempted to to treat the subject not not exclusively, but uh, as a flashback. And my uh, impression, or my almost immediate impression, was that the uh, that the flashbacks overpowered the, the present day narrative. And uh, but what Kim Soom did, and she likewise has created a narrative that is set in the present day, but involves considerable flashbacks to a comfort station on the plains of Manchuria. What she did was she rigorously researched the testimony of the former comfort women. And recall, those of you who have uh, who have studied this topic, you'll know that it wasn't until 1991, more than almost 50 years after the end of the Pacific War, that Kim Hak Soon went public with her uh, description of her experiences. And uh, then in, in 1995, I believe it was a short-lived journal uh, called Mue in New York City at that time published their first and perhaps only issue, but it included a uh, feature, uh, including uh, an interview with Huang Kum Ju um, So the, the, the period in which, in which the comfort women have been, have uh, become a uh, subject of, of, of public debate and discussion has been has been quite limited. But what Kim Soon did was to research the um, the records that have become available, including the firsthand testimony of these women, uh, dating from the from the time that Kim Soon went public in 1991. And the result you will see in the back of the book are about eight or nine pages of endnotes, over 300 in all. And these are uh, these endnotes refer to the testimony of the women. They refer to media accounts. There's even, uh, I think, a couple of uh, of television uh, documentaries about the women. And so what we have is a present tense narrative that is entirely the, the imagination of the author, but the flashbacks are solidly grounded in the historical record. What we're, the flashbacks are providing us with the voices of these girls. And for many of them, that's what they were in the comfort station, not, not out of their teens. And so uh, this, has allowed Kim Soon to present us with a uh, with an account that we can think of as coming directly from the historical record, but she is contextualizing it in by setting by situating the uh, limited third person narrative, the narrator, in a Western style home in a neighborhood of Seoul. I think we can understand the, the, the locale to be Seoul. And this neighborhood is undergoing redevelopment. So most of the people have already lived out. So just as the protagonist, who is nameless until the very end of the novel, has lived a shadow existence and she and, and a few others managed to escape from the Manchurian comfort station and make their way back across the Amnokong to what is now North Korea and then back to South Korea. And uh, it should be remembered that of the 200,000 individuals who were taken away, it, is thought that only about 15,000 
made it back to Korea. So uh, the protagonist uh, has made it back to Korea, but has lived a shadow existence. No one knows. Uh, she is not registered. No one in her family or anyone else knows of her past. And she, her shadow existence continues in this home in a basically an abandoned neighborhood where she is glued to the television set uh, looking at reports and accounts of the uh, number of remaining how many. And at the beginning of the novel, or we are told that uh, when she began doing this, there were 52 left. And by the present of the novel, they, their numbers are rapidly declining until at the very end, there is only one left. Now, the, the, the scenes of this neighborhood that we see, and, and we, should, we should understand that the protagonist is a, is a kind of placeholder in the sense that when a, uh, when a neighborhood is scheduled for demolition, uh, any of you who are familiar with Jose He's great linked story novel, The Dwarf, will know that the usual procedure is that the residents, um, in this case, legal residents in, in, in Jose He's novel, they were, they were squatters, but the residents are notified that the structures will be demolished, but in return for that, they will get priority rights to um, a dwelling in the new housing that is to be is to be built and so the protagonist nephew has uh has at least one of these abandoned dwellings in return for which he and his family will get uh, priority rights for new housing in the city of seoul the nephew lives in suwon so the protagonist is a kind of placeholder she will not she will have no um, no no place waiting for her once the once the new housing comes up, and so she is focusing on the uh, on the lives of the remaining comfort women, and in her occasional outing, she comes across um, a variety of characters and. These characters, several of them, seem somehow to be marginalized or disabled, which seems to be author Kim Soon's suggestion that there are not just the comfort women, but there are other individuals who, in a sense, live a kind of shadow existence and have lost some of their individuality. She sees, for example, a father and a son. The father is a um, is a basically a rag picker who goes about uh, the abandoned dwellings, stripping copper for for resale. But his son has special needs; is uh, developmentally delayed. We also see a the local mini mart, which is operated by a husband and wife. The good wife uh, is is not ambulatory. She's wheelchair bound. And uh, there is also a girl uh, who turns out to be, the pregnant ask her this, 13 years old, which is the same age at which the protagonist was taken away from her ancestral home. She was out with her sisters gathering gathering snails from the, from the local stream. When a truck came up, out came some men. They seized her. They threw her in, in the back of the truck. And she was taken to the city of Tegu, where she was loaded on a train with other girls. And over a several-day journey, they were taken to this comfort station, Manchuria. So the we see in the uh in, in the people in the lives of the people that the protagonist meets in the present day kind of glimpses and connections with what uh, she herself went through 70 years earlier and uh, 
there's another scene in which uh, she, the protagonist, comes across some policemen around the local mini mart, and it turns out that the police have discovered some uh, individual squatting in a building in the neighborhood. And uh, it suggested that they're Chinese and the implication is that they are also victims of human trafficking. So in this way, the, the protagonist is reminded uh, of the past. And finally, at the end of the novel, she makes a fateful decision. There's only one of the Halmanis left. She is at a university hospital. She is not expected to live much longer. And the protagonist decides that she will visit her and tell her that even after you have gone, there will be one left, me. So she gets on the bus. She takes public transportation. And along the way, she has an epiphany she remembers her given name, the name that she was given at birth and has not used for the last 70 years. And the last time it was used was precisely when she was at the comfort station with the other girls, the sisters, many of them referred to as Unni in the narrative. And she and the other girls were being taken to a comfort station across the river and in on their way along the boat the boat encountered some rough water she the protagonist was thrown overboard and she recalls that when the other girls were rescuing her they were referring to her by her given name which is pungil so she remembers them calling her pungira pungira it's going to be okay so by doing this, by reclaiming her name after 70 years time, Kim Soon is suggesting to us that this individual, this Han Yang, reclaimed her identity. She reclaimed her individuality. And it was not just her, it was all, we can see this as a symbolic reclamation of all of the other 200,000 girls that were taken from their homes. And in this way, Kim Soon uh, avoids the risk of Japan bashing. And already in the English language, uh, Japanese press, uh, there have been many comments, uh, as you can probably imagine, oh, when is Korea ever going to grow up and what, this, this again. But no, that's not at all what Kim Soon is involved in. She's involved in a reclamation project. She's involved in restoring to historical memory, the voices, the experiences, the lives of each and every one of these 200,000 girls and young women. And uh, what could be a finer purpose for a creative writer? So with that, now you get to hear Ju Chan tell you all about our author Kim Soon and about the saga, finding a publisher. <laughs> Hi, this is Ju Chan. Thank you for inviting us and thank you for this opportunity. And uh, Kim Sung, Kim Sung is a new author for us, means that we translated for the first time of her work. We've been translating over 40 years over four dozens of writers. Number doesn't matter, but we, we really like to introduce good work and good stories and share with the readers in English spoken word. Kim Soon, I uh, learned that she is workhorse and last decade, means that maybe 2011 to this year, she'd published 16 books. It's unbelievable. She is 46 years old and she's uh, published over 20 books. 
And also I learned, it's all, all I learned is recent event. She is the most awarded with all these literary awards, uh, Isang, Hyundai, you know, Dongin this year and Tesan and all that. But most important thing is that regardless how many she's published, she is most underrepresented writer. And so we are very happy to introduce Kim Sung to you. For Kim Sung, her work started with me, family, but one point with the work L's sneaker. L is Yi Han Yeol, who is a student activist, got killed by was it um, tear gas sharpener? And uh, that's the turning point that she started looking at this society and her roots and, um, and history. And then her interest about comfort women started back 2014, she published a short story called Puri Iyagi, which is a story about roots. And that earned her Isang prize. There she mentioned glimpse of comfort woman. I'm going to tell you comfort woman as a harmony from now on, because they are all the ladies with affection. We can call her, call them the, uh, harmony. And, uh, 2016, Han Myung, where is my book? Han Myung came out from Hyundai Muna. The reason she, it, she was thinking that what would it happen when all those ladies die? Who will talk about the history? And I want to write about them. And this is my duty. So, but then her imagination alone won't work, won't do the job. So she tenaciously researched and it was a very painful project for her. And she waited till the time that she naturally, you know, uh, with the possession, possessed by kind of spirit, start writing. Her goal is that she want to tell their stories and they, uh, she wanted to remove prejudice as much as possible. And she's telling you and us to everybody that think they are part of your family, maybe neighbors, and they are victims. And we really wanna help her to spread her message. In fact, uh, these ladies, the harmonies, they are working, many of them working for the victim of sexual violence in Korea. I started reading Kim Soon for a long time but 2017, I was reading a novel, which is about 400 pages. The background is conflict between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law happened to be in the afternoon for four hours long period. She wrote uh, about 400 pages long stories. And I was thinking, how could a Korean writer with this kind of mentality, is it possible? And the research ship for Korean writers, it's not really, um, you know, it's not the, what is that, common thing or very rare. 
And, uh, and then I start reading more. And I also found that she wrote 800 pages for two girls, two sisters who are traditional seamstresses. And uh, her focus, her themes varies in depth and width is really vast. And uh, I was also reading from the, uh, you know, the seamstress and uh, this uh, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. And then I was reading this super noir stories and it's uh, like a little child of waiting for Kodo. And uh, I read three times, I still don't understand. That's called Norangeru Bariryo, which is, uh, you know, disposing uh, mongrel or something. And uh, so I was very intrigued about this author. And then I came to one left. So when we start translating a new author, I try to read as much as possible of this writer's work to understand uh, the writer and style. And I want to be in her word. And so Han Myung, one left, first of all, it's the first novel written by a Korean author about comfort women and their legacy. There was a, a novella by Yoon Jung Mo before, but this is the first novel. And also the setting is in present Korea. And uh, that also was one of our interests. We always want to know how people live in Korea, present setting, highly developed country. I'm sure there are people hidden in the darkness. And more than that, this is happy ending story. We like, uh, we actually our goal is finding story or novel with humor. Koreans love humor. Actually, when you sit with them, Korean language, Hangul is really fun to mix together and make new words. And the joke, it's unbelievable. However, writing that down in the paper must be very difficult. Finding a novel with the humor, it's very, very rare and hard coming. But this is a happy ending story, story of triumph and liberation of human bandage. So we like that uh, very much. And more than that, we wanted help Kim Soon. We are therefore in the mission to spread words and uh, I want to listen to the uh, voices of these girls. I am going to read briefly and then we can uh, enjoy very much of Kim Sun's writing. But meantime, finding a publisher was another story because I know Kim Sun and us, we have one goal to publish this book and uh, let the world know their story, the girls' stories. We won a um, very competitive American Pan Heim translation grant. And uh, at the same time, the timing of this work was when we were about to translate there was a brewing uh, of Me Too movement in US and people's awareness about sexual violence, victims, 
human uh, smuggling, their awareness it was growing. And then we got very strong support from the author and the publisher. However, when we actually translating, we already started translating and uh, we already hit the first obstacle. The author gave someone else permission to translate. So uh, we understand that kind of situation. And uh, so we told them we are not asking exclusive right, but let us do the work and whoever find the publisher first and that they, you know, that person can publish will walk away, we said. So that was our journey. It was very, very highly motivated and full support, but then suddenly we plopped the, to the ground. So we started. And uh, we had one, two, three publishers. Uh, we sent a proposal. The first one is biggest commercial publisher. And then second is the uh, academic publisher that we've work long time, we've published about five, six books. And uh, there, one of reviewer said, this is a voyeuristic book, too graphic. That really shocked us. And then publisher said that, we don't need another sensational book. That really, another, like, uh, you know, we were stupefied. And um, so I was asking myself, why this is a sensational? Why don't I know about these girls and I'm learning while I'm working on this book? So we protested to the publisher, the academic publisher, and told them that, you think that this is sensational, but however, there are so many people don't know. They know the words of a comfort woman. That's it, what about it? Then they are just mom, okay? And so, but then it didn't work. Number three publisher been waiting from the beginning. So we signed the contract at the end of nine, uh, 2018. However, Korea side refused to sign and last about five to six months and they don't want to sign it because they don't want to pay U.S. tax. Well, in order to avoid the tax, you have to file a form. They didn't want to do that. So uh, we decided that maybe there was something else that we don't know. And uh, they, uh, by then, the Korea side, the publisher brought an agent. To this agent, we are the bottom of the barrel, just translator, and we are very rude, pressing a couple of ruffians, nothing but the last one for decision making. That really crushed us, and uh, we got really sick physically, mentally, we practically gave up the project and our passion and love for translating. Korean literature was really crushed. So we didn't do anything till we were in Korea uh, 2019, May. We happened to see full page ad about a letter very brief letter written by a living harmony to dead harmony. That made us really sad and we were raged. So we got regained, we, we regained our energy and we start sending out proposals again. 
And uh, going on and on, everybody said, oh, that this is very important, important. But as Bruce mentioned, there were over 300 endnotes. I think that was one of the obstacles for the publishers. And so we were thinking that maybe, maybe the end notes can be removed. Well, what does it mean? That means that we are killing the soul of the book. Her goal is getting all these girls through testimony. She wants to make sure that everybody knows that it was based on history. So we couldn't do that. So on and on, we sent proposals. And the number 32 happened to be University of Washington Press, which is practically within a stone, you know, thrown distance behind our backyard. And it was accepted. However, Korea side said no. This time, the money is too little. So we gave up for another three four months. And then finally, I mean, it's the, between all this, we've been constantly writing emails to them, reminding them that our goal, our mission is this book come out as soon as possible before all this harmony dies. Remember that. So the the length of emails we've, we've written is about book length. And uh, finally, last year in the fall, actually in October, we met them in Korea about two hours, the uh, writer and agent, Kim Soon and uh, the agent. And they realized that we are not bad people. We are not money hungry, old geezers and uh, bad mannered rupians. So let's do it. So this book, we, even though it was published in September, we were so numb. We got really tired of this project. And uh, I really tell you that no one should go through this process. When we have all good intentions and passion and the love for uh, spreading Korean literatures and the business involves get things tangled on and there is no result. And uh, so it was really um, long coming, almost two years in negotiations. And uh, I think that some of Korean authors or agents thinks that finding a publisher, especially the book is uh, translated in different languages and finding a publisher, somehow they misinformed that it, uh, it will bring a bundle of gold, but that's not it because uh, going through this book, we never had this kind of experience and uh, brought us the feeling of we are really minority. Korean literature in US, it's really, really minority. Although there are some, you know, star uh, writers and uh, translators, but majority of Korean authors their translated books. It's very, very difficult to find a publisher. And uh, once again, we like to make sure that this book is a novel based on the uh, actual testimony, based on the history. So I like to share with you, this is my gift to you. And it shows that how masterful Kim Sung is and uh, she has imagination and uh, she this this piece little piece is how powerful how imaginative and uh, how poetically beautiful 
her writing is. And so here comes, and uh, she, uh, one of the girls, older girls, died um, from, you know, TB. And uh, these girls, uh, they uh, try to uh, don her as beautiful as possible in the most harrowing situations. And so, and then this one shows a little bit of the age of innocence. They are teenage girls. And uh, here is my Korean. 동숙 언니가 죽었어. 애순이 울면서 동숙 언니의 방에서 나왔다. 금복 언니는 동숙 언니가 가지고 있던 옷들 중 가장 성한 옷을 찾아 동숙 언니에게 입혔다. 동숙 언니의 가지런하고 기다란 속눈썹들이 시계 초침처럼 떨리고 있어서 그녀는 동숙 언니가 살아 있는 게 아닌가 싶었다. 꽃이 없어서 소녀들은 저마다 입김으로 크고 작은 꽃을 피워 동숙 언니를 장식했다. 수옥 언니의 입이 벌어질 때마다 뻐드렁니가 쑥 튀어나오면서 고추꽃 같은 꽃이 선호 송이 피어났다. 연순과 해금이 입김이 어우러져 목단화를 피었다. 금복 언니는 동숙 언니의 얼굴 바로 위에서 불도화처럼 커다란 꽃을 힘겹게 피우고 있었다. Thank you. I will read a slightly longer version of this. This scene takes place uh, one winter day at the comfort station in Manchuria. One day, Tongsuk Oni coughed up blood, the deep red color of wild strawberries. Her face turned ashen, and the next they knew she was having trouble walking. The girls whispered among themselves that she'd come down with lung disease. Tongsu Gani's cough got worse, but still, haha, that is, the Japanese madam at the comfort station, made her take soldiers. After she caught blood while taking a soldier, haha turned the nameplate on her door backside out. And to make sure the other girls would not catch her ailment, Haha ha prevented them from visiting her. From time to time, the girls could hear Tongsuk Oni coughing her lungs out, and all day her room bore a somber chill along with a bloody stink. The girls would peep into Tongsuk Oni's room whenever Haha ha was not looking. The frosts arrived and Tongsuk Oni's condition deteriorated rapidly. Kumbok Onni stopped to see Haha ha on her way to the wash area with a tin wash basin containing a bloody towel from Tongsuk Onni's room. Can't you send her home? I'm not sending her anywhere until she pays off her debt. Even while Tongsuk Onni was coughing the last of her lifeblood, her debt continued to swell like a cocoon spun by a silkworm. Can't I pay it off for her? Do you have any idea how much you owe us? You pay off your debt first and then I'll listen to you. And with that, Haha ha turned and disappeared. Even an imminent death would not make her any more generous. An officer on horseback arrived in the middle of the night to find her in bed weeping, her here referring to our protagonist, her unnamed protagonist. After he had fallen asleep, she left to go to the toilet. Along the way and shivering with cold, she looked into Tongsuk Ani's room. Kumbok Ani was at Tongsuk Ani's bedside watching over her. Eerie moonlight filtered through the ice-glazed window. The station was tranquil as if everyone was gone and only the three of them were left. Not even the sound of breathing could be heard from Chunhee Onni's room 
across the way, where earlier, around midnight, a bestial whale had escaped as if she were being taken to a slaughterhouse. Rubbing the instep of her frozen foot against the back of her other leg, she gazed at Tongsuk on his brazier. Amid the white ash, a single coal glowed faintly. It looked to her like the heart of a dying hare, left unnoticed among the spent coals. The least she could do was give Tongsuk on me some coal, but she had none. She had the elusive sensation that the air in the room was changing, along with the waning of the glow. Over Kumbok on his shoulder, she could see Tongsuk on his face. It was devoid of expression. Kumbok on he reached out and caressed the expressionless face. The bloody stench from the room was painfully nauseating and forced her to stifle her breathing. You should get some sleep on me, she managed to say. You're right. But now she was combing Tongsuk on his hair with her fingers, like a mother sending off a daughter at daybreak to her new in-laws in a far off place. Tongsuk Anni, who had just now dropped off to sleep, never woke up. Kumbok Anni dressed Tongsuk Anni in the best preserved of her garments. Tongsuk Anni's long eyelashes seemed to twitch faintly like the second hand of a clock. Maybe she's still alive, she herself wondered. No flowers were available, and so the girls opened their mouths and adorned Tongsuk Anni with a bouquet of vapor blossoms. Suok Anni opened her mouth, and from between her buck teeth came tiny white flowers resembling those of chili pepper plants. Yunsun and Hegum mingled their breath to produce a peony. And perched above Tongsuk Ani's face, Kumbok Ani was painstakingly fashioning a huge flower that resembled a snowball viburnum. And that is our reading from One Left. Thank you very much, Bruce and Juchan. <laughs> Sorry, if we were in a real live situation, then there would be claps and <laughs> applause. <laughs> but um, I guess I'll just make mention an applause sound, <laughs> I'm sure. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation of, you know, to talk about uh, uh, Kim Sung's works, at Kim Sung's work, as well as uh, your journey with uh, the translation of, of her works. and. I think it's great that, you know, as sounded like it was a harrowing journey, but, you know, it, it, it got there. <laughs> we're really, we're really, you know, happy that it's, it's out in the world and it's published. Um, and so uh, we thank you very much for, for sharing that with us and for doing the work so that the work, you know, is out in the world for us, uh, for an audience you know, beyond uh, sort of those who don't know Korean. <laughs> so English, I speak. thank you very much. So um, I, for the, uh, we'll start the Q&A session and um, I'm advised that a Q&A in this webinar will be available for audience members to put in the chat box. So I'm afraid it's not like some classes where, or some lectures where you raise your hand and where you get to speak, but, um, if uh, please, we invite uh, attendees to um, to uh, raise questions uh, for Bruce and Chutan, um, and uh, the questions will only be seen by us, <laughs> so it won't be sort of uh, seen by uh, participants. For those of you who are shy, <laughs> and what I will do is um, I will read out the questions um, so that Bruce and Chutan can address them. So. Uh, May we have any sort of questions from the audience, please, uh, using the chat box. And Charles, I, I'm guessing that the audience members can access the, the chat Q&A? Yes, they, they certainly can. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, so any questions from the audience, please? 
Okay, so one question uh, is, do you have any plans for translating any other of Kim Sum's novels? I need to answer, okay. Um, I am, we are actually involved with several projects and uh, we are waiting for a new book. Uh, she is, she sent it. And that's about the Koryo Saram, Korean Russians, their roots got uprooted by Stalin and 170,000 people were put in on a um, cattle car train. And uh, it just came out and uh, she got Dongin Prize. And I'm very interested in reading it because we also uh, deal with this issue when we translated Jo Jong Nes, How in Heaven's Name, O Ha Nanim. And uh, there, one chapter is devoted for Goryo Saram. And uh, Kim Sum wrote Han Myung, and after that, she wrote three more books involved the comfort woman. So she was very dedicated for the comfort woman issue. And then now she is into Korean Russians because of one person that she happened to see in a, a TV program, the eyes kept her. And uh, there was the journey of writing the Goryeo Saram. And she's going to write the second book after extensive research about how they settled in the area, the Kazakhstan and Uzbek, their area. And so um, we don't know yet, but uh, uh, we are, when we translate one writer, our interest never stop in that writer. Uh, I think we've, uh, we have a longevity as a translator, probably uh, one last remaining, oh, as a couple, of course, but one last remaining uh, independent translators. I hope not. But our interest in the authors that we invested, it's uh, forever, as long as those writers invest themselves in good work, we are here to invest again. So thank you. Thank you, Jitan. So we have uh, uh, two questions, actually. Uh, one is um, a bit longer, so I'll read that first. Uh, so they say, first of all, thank you very much for sharing the anecdote of your painful and grand journey to get your translation published. Since once One Left is a historical fiction that may have socio-political impact on society, as translators of this work, did you face any difficulties and obstacles when you were working on your translation? I, I don't think that we had obstacles. I think we enjoyed, uh, well, it was painful, but we spaced that very well. And uh, we uh, were able to translate uh, fine. But then we had uh, that end notes. It's all the, uh, you know, historical background and then also recordings. And so we had to double check. And that was really, that took a really long time. And we also found that some mistakes there too. And for example, there was a Kim Bok Dong and uh, the, uh, there was a four different Kim Bok Dong by the different birth year. And uh, according to the uh, specialist, and there got to be only one Kim Bok Dong. So there was a lot of clearing uh, some, you know, the issues and it took a long time. Yeah. Did I answer all? 
Yeah, I think um, there are several other questions. So I, I think, okay. yes, <laughs> if, if not, then the, the person who asked the question could maybe do a follow up later. But uh, let me just get uh, there are some other questions that have come through in the meantime. So the other shorter question was, um, uh, they said, I love the cover of the book. It is beautiful and simple, reflects some purity. Can you tell us why this bird has been selected? Oh, God. <laughs> That's a very good question. Okay, we are very fussy about book cover, very fussy. I think we are spoiled uh, from the beginning and uh, our uh, most successful book, Words of Farewell, the cover uh, was painting by my friend's sister. And uh, we decided that we are going to use uh, friends work if it's available. So uh, we've been doing that and uh, same time we uh, our book like a four or five volumes of book from Colombia we actually had kind of a personal designer who whose name is Changje Changje Lee from Seattle. It's very close to our house. He, uh, his mother lived and uh, they really try to uh, meet our demand. But when the uh, University of Washington Press comes, the, uh, this is the fourth cover. And uh, we complained all three covers, but then this fourth one, they didn't even show us. But I think, I think we, probably learned and uh, we should not be fussy anymore but i don't know <laughs> however i think timing wise timing wise we are all suffering with the covid and we need some kind of comfort and this book actually is very um calm and soothing and gives simple comfort and we uh it, grow, it grows with us. And uh, actually, it also reflects uh, the, um, the family of the girl, the uh, you know, abducted girl. Mother kept telling other um, siblings that go check whether your sister is there because the gachi magpie is crying. So it's, uh, it really... Um, symbol of news it shows the cover is and we are very happy with the cover now the uh, the cover that we originally wanted this is the this is the sonyo song the um the sculpture that um sits near the Somerset Hotel and also across the alley from the Japanese Embassy in Seoul. Uh, but we managed to compromise by having it appear as the frontispiece. And, and the cover itself, uh, as Ju Chan mentioned, is uh, of, a, of a magpie. And one of the details in the present narrative of the novel is that uh, the protagonist uh, has a uh, has a stray cat that she's developed a relationship with, and the stray cat is in the habit of bringing her a magpie. So um, the magpie, of course, has this uh, this connection with when when she was taken at the age of thirteen, and uh, to the extent that. Once or twice, the protagonist um, looks down at her slippers, which uh, sit on the shoe ledge, and uh, imagines that they're magpies. So, if we if we think of magpies um, as deliverers of news, then uh, and remember that at this at this stage in the narrative, the protagonist is basically counting down the number of surviving how many, then um, the, the cover uh, makes makes perfect sense. And, and 
and several readers have, have commented on how, uh, as Chu Chan mentioned, there's a there's a kind of a sense of calmness that I think is very salutary, considering uh, the very disturbing graphic content of the flashbacks in the novel. So we're very happy about how the cover turned out. Thank you. Since you mentioned the statue, I'll actually ask a question that came in about the statue that uh, you shared with us. So this question is the recently the Comfort Women statue has been erected in Germany and especially many states of the United States. I am curious about your opinion about this. Mm. Well, um, Again, I'm referring to my modern Korean novel seminar course that's just concluded at UBC. And one of my students is German. And she told me, she has just returned to Germany for the, for the holidays. And she mentioned that it is a, uh, a little known historical fact that inside the German concentration camps during World War II, there was a comfort station. And uh, again, this is something that she said that Germans have very little idea about uh, what is happening. And so the, um, the, the erection of the recreation of the Sonyo song at places outside of Korea, we regard again, not as a, an attempt to rekindle uh, bad feelings between, between one nation or one people or another, but again, as a process of recovery, as a process of truth and reconciliation, as a process of returning to historical memory the lives of so many people who have been affected in such traumatic ways by, by, the, by the, the great workings of history, which we tend to engage with in textbooks as a matter of institutions, of countless groups of people, but uh, all too rare are occasions for us to realize that yes, somebody's mother, somebody's sister, somebody's daughter uh, was taken away, never to be seen again, no news. And um, the empathy that a response to this state of affairs requires, I think is something that is in increasingly short supply in this divided, contested, interrogated all these adjectives about the current state of Korean studies that makes me sick. It's, uh, it's time to focus uh, on healing, restoration, and uh, bringing people back together again. And that's what I hope will be, will be the purpose of the, of the recreation of these images outside of Korea. Thank you. So we have several questions, actually. Uh, so this one relates to, uh, I suppose, the um, representations or understanding uh, the Korean comfort women issue. And I'll read it. It's quite, I'm sure they would have said it out loud. So I'll just read it through. So thank you for sticking with this project. It is a very important novel to have in English, not least because there are several novels by Korean Americans that I suspect do not clarify and help our understanding of the issues. You mentioned the challenge of having a novel accepted as valid for an academic publisher. My question follows from this. There are three types of information we can access for traumatic issues like The Comfort Woman. First is commentaries, such as those by uh, Bonio, Teju Kim, etc. Second is testimonies, uh, such as an uh, edited collection by uh, Keith Howard, uh, known as True, True Stories of the Comfort Woman from 1995. And thirdly, from novels. So what do you think the role of each of these, so testimonies, commentaries, and novels, uh, is for teaching or study? And how can the three be used together in promoting understanding of such an important issue? Well, it's, uh, it makes perfect sense in, um, 
uh, I, from the point of view of a historian, a sociologist, an anthropologist, to marshal all of, all of the available resources, um, I don't feel qualified as a as a specialist in literature, literary translation, to comment uh, on the uh, on the testimony or the um, uh, or the or the scholarly literature. We are very grateful to the scholarly literature, and um, uh, it's it's worth mentioning that um, that the that the scholars who have, who have done the groundwork for understanding the the legacy and the context of the of the comfort women uh, have themselves uh, been challenged and um, uh, attacked for 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 daring to to engage in this research. So we we have a great deal of respect for that, but um, our uh, our concern as literary translators is to find a narrative that um, in which the author has uh, adapted an appropriate narrative style to to the subject matter, and this, I think, remains the the fundamental reason that we that we decided to translate this novel. I mentioned earlier the propensity in the Korean literature power structure, the Mundan, to privilege works of uh, social engagement. The uh, and we, if we look at Kim Soon's novel in this light, then I think this is the finest a kind of socially engaged novel, as opposed to a work by a less skilled writer who might uh, end up knowingly or unknowingly beating her or his readers over the head with a with a message. So it's um, it's a it's an approach that uh, carries with us a certain amount of risks, but also I think a certain amount of rewards. Okay. Thank you. That comment, by the way, because it was signed by that person, I could tell you was from Keith Howard himself. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he put his name down. So thank you, Keith, for that question. Um, and uh, I have several more questions here. Um, uh, this relates to uh, sort of comfort women novels in general. So it says, I read one other novel about Korean comfort women written by a Korean or Chinese male author several years ago. It had a rather pro-Japanese slant, showing the friendship between Korean and Japanese comfort women working for a comfort station located in Burma, they think, or another location. Um, do you know of any other novels by any chance? Well, first of all, uh, Nora Okja Keller, the comfort woman, and also there were two uh, two head of dragons. What was that? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. White chrysanthemum. And uh, uh, there is a Filipino Americans uh, uh, writing about Lola's house. And uh, Changle, Yi Changle's gesture gestured life. life. And there's one more I read. Um, I cannot think, I'm not, I'm not good at memorizing things, but, but then, uh, before I have to emphasize that before I started, you know, making decision to translate this book, not to mention this is a first Korean novel written by a Korean author, but I wanted to make sure that this got to be different. Okay, no duplicate. And the so I read half a dozen books about comfort women and also watched documentary and went to lectures and decided that this got to be translated and it really calls us to do it. And it's because that because that setting or you know is a present. And of course, it's a happy ending. 
the same time and uh, written by Korean. And um, that's, that's uh, instead of written by Americans or something. And it's also based on really extensive research by the author. And um, so I try to do my job to make sure that it's not duplicating in a kind of same kind of work. Thank you. So um, we have another sort of three sets of questions Two I actually pertain to translation, but uh, the next one that I'll read out has more to do with the comfort woman uh, question. And it says, I understand Japan apologized for the comfort women some time ago. Did the surviving comfort women or the Korean families receive personal apologies and any financial compensation from Japan? Uh, our understanding is that a, uh, a private and non-governmental foundation was commissioned by the Japanese government to extend the apology. Um, but this, um, we aren't aware of the particulars of, of this. Um, I, I will say though, uh, this came as a surprise to us, but a couple of months ago, we gave a presentation to the Center for Korea Studies here at the University of Washington. And during the question and answer session, uh, Professor Hyung Chul, who's a professor of political science, he uh, uh, contextualized the question by saying that the uh, Republic of Korea has not yet ushered, uh, not yet issued a formal apology to the comfort women. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, how could he make a mistake like that? He's obviously referring to the, to the Japanese government. But no, to my surprise, I didn't realize this. Uh, apparently, the Republic of Korea either uh, either he was referring back a year or two ago. I, we're still not sure if, 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 if the ROK government has issued a formal apology, but he was referring to the Republic of Korea government uh, as not having offered an official apology. And that, um, that of course, restored to our, to our consciousness the um, the the issue of uh, of collective guilt and um, and complicity, which are which are issues that uh, Chung Hee Sarah So researched for her uh, Cornell volume, The Comfort Women, and uh, and for which she was attacked. And Pani O oh said that she or she was shunned by Korean friends, Korean families. Uh, when I was reading and I was working, it really bothered me that why I don't know more than just words, comfort woman. And looking back, I don't think we were taught. Korean educational system did not teach this. And that, uh, I didn't know that. I thought I've been in US so long, I'm getting old, I'm not paying attention to things. But during our lecture tours, I've learned that, yes, that's true. We did not teach this period much, especially comfort women. But I think the younger generation, uh, early uh, 1990s, when this issue came public. I think they were more aware of this issue. But um, so this is a very uh, learning period for me. And uh, uh, we are, we are glad. And also when we took on this uh, work, we were not thinking about politics, all the money things just like the author intended to do and uh, put back the, this harmonious dignity 
and then prejudice, uh, get rid of the prejudice and the spread words that they can be your grandma and your neighbors and uh, you're somebody that you know. Well, after this book came out, we were very lucky to have a reporter from Kyoto News Agency who followed us for two years after we just received a uh, American Penheim translation grant. He interviewed us in New York over uh, two hours. And his first question was, why took so long, over 70 some years, for Korean writer to write a book like this? His uh, interest in us and it, this book really was life source for us to keep going on. Because when we had the trouble of Korean side, I, I am emphasizing Korean side, but the author and us, I think we had the same goal, same goal with the book published as soon as possible. But then there is business issues. So the human relationship was really twisted, but I do believe that they are all good people but um, I don't think that they don't know much about the publishing industry in US. And uh, they were misinformed a lot of times that Korean journalists or media talks about, you know, the big things like award and money in all big things, but then they don't, uh, you know, uh, really report much of other parts. And I think we were lacking with the trust from the beginning and uh, only business first. There's no human relationship. And so, and um, after this book out and because of that, the Kyoto journal, uh, journalist, Kyoto news agent journalist, he published a news article and then two more uh, news article in Japan Times and Japan Today came out. However, about three months still gone, there is none such, no, no Korean media covered. I feel that Koreans, it's been so much publicity and we've heard this word comfort, comfort, comfort woman. I think in a way we think we know but we are numb and uh, uh, we are very complacent. We don't really know about this issue. So that's what Kim Soon also believes and uh, why she was doing research. And so we try to reach out as much as possible. And that's why we are the eagerly going for the uh, everywhere we can go and uh, let, you know, people know about this girl's voices and you know and uh, um so we also we want the um korean community involves uh to move on to next step thank you thank you so there are three remaining questions but i think i'll read out two which i think relates to uh, what Chan just uh, talked about uh first has to do with uh, i guess um uh, translation or uh, sort of um uh, the korean side's response uh in in the translation industry the other one has more to do with the feedback from the from the victims themselves so the first question is and then you can choose to answer whichever order so the first one is um thank you so much i'm really surprised that you had so much difficulty from the korean side but thanks for persevering i think you said they were expecting that publication aboard, uh, abroad would be a big money spinner. <laughs> Can I ask, do you know how many translated Korean titles genuinely are <laughs> money spinners? So that's the first question. Uh, it's almost like a rhetorical uh, question perhaps. And then the second one was, have you received any feedback about the book from the victims themselves? 
how authentic have they found it? Mm. To, uh, to, to the first question, and, and uh, I'll say thank you, Philip, for that, um, for that question and, and for all you do on behalf of, of Korean literature and, and, and Korean, Korean culture in general. And I, I should warn you, this is my this is my rant about um, uh, about Korean to English literary translation of fiction in the last ten years. The um, once upon a time, this could be a horangi ga dumbi piutehi back when tigers used to smoke. Uh, translators and authors. Uh, basically, were were partners in a in a joint effort to uh, broaden the readership of uh, of a of a literary work that uh, was deserving of a of a wider audience. the The business part of it was, was very simple. Uh, half and half were were, were partners. In a, uh, in a in a creative enter enterprise, uh, basically you could think of it as a handshake arrangement. We have the author's best interests in mind, and then about ten years ago, um, Gejo, which I guess is a polite way to put it, other third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties got involved. Literary agents came along. Uh, before long, there were rights representatives of publishing companies. It used to be in the Korean publishing industry, there were two kinds of rights, yongkwan and pankwan. Pankwan, as you can imagine, these are the sales of, uh, of a work uh, retained by the publisher. Yongkwan, which we can think of as subsidiary rights, these are held by the author. Uh, over the last 10 years, the Yonkwan, the subsidiary rights, have often been transferred to a literary agent, uh, or in some cases, two literary agents, one on each side of the Pacific, and or to a Korean publisher's representative. So, um, and uh, last but not least, we have the presence of uh, a quasi-governmental uh, organization that funds, subsidizes, enters into relationships with publishers to publish translations of uh, Korean, mostly Korean fiction. Uh, in many cases, works that have been commissioned, uh, and again, I use quotation marks, basically paid um, translations that have been paid for that have been accumulating dust for years and years and years. Unfortunately, there is no code of professional conduct to, uh, no, there's no guidelines uh, by which all the various players in this increasingly commercial and I would say mercenary enterprise and um perhaps inevitably the more recent entrance into this process they can point and say wow look at shin gyung suk and look at kim young ha you know he landed a, a good contract he's gotten a lot of visibility i need to uh, also do my best to make sure that my author uh, as an equal opportunity to thrive. And that mindset is understandable, but it's also understandable that the translators would be dismissed as non-players in the arrangement, which is precisely what happened to us. And uh, un fortunately, in the end, we did something that we should have done from the very beginning. We should have got on an airplane and flown to Korea and met personally with the author and her agent, and we could have saved 
about a year of, uh, of very unpleasant communications. But this is this is the reality of uh, of the uh, of trying to publish a translation of contemporary Korean fiction. Some publishers will not deal with translators. They will deal only with agents. The, um, the communication process has devolved into a basically, from the point of view of the publishers, maybe if we don't answer them, they'll go away and won't bother us anymore. There's very little uh, effort to uh, engage in the most basic of professional courtesy when it comes to translators. And um, in my mind, it has become a very sordid and um, I would almost say disgraceful enterprise. So um, as Juchan mentioned, we had several very positive, we had very, we had several very positive contacts, I believe with publishers, but uh, the reality is that in the United States, literature and translation has never fared well. Uh, in an average year in Korea, uh, as much as 60% of the books being published are translations. In the US, the comparable figure is 3%. So it's a very limited market and um, it has become increasingly difficult for translators such as ourselves who do not work with agents to find a home for um, what we believe are works of literature that demand um, an audience. And uh, I, I hope you'll forgive us for mentioning this. I hope this doesn't come across as too self-serving, but some of you may be familiar with a novel by Kong Ji Young that was published about 10 years ago in Korea called Togani. The title comes from Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, which was about the Salem witch trials. And this novel is about an actual case of systemic sexual abuse of special needs children at an institution in Southern Korea. The novel itself uh, was mildly successful in Korea, but when it was made into a film, it caused such a stir that changes were made to the Korean legal system so that individuals convicted of such crimes no longer received a slap on the wrist. So uh, this is a novel that I have used in my modern Korean novel course, and it consistently is rated by the students as one of the most compelling, most engaging works. And this work uh, also has gone unpublished for, for 10 years. So um, the, the reality is if one does not work with, with, with an agent, if, um, then uh, basically you're you're on you're on your own and and sadly the um, the human relationship that once characterized our uh, relationships with our authors has has dissipated to, to a considerable extent. I think I think you you your rent should stop, but I think <laughs> the uh, we also found the publisher for that book however uh it's not you know uh it it doesn't work for the agent for the deal or business kind of arrangement or something so uh i think ultimately we need to learn that we have to work together especially korean literature in translation field is very very small um it, it's a really small community. And then you look at the uh, Korea, you know, selling authors, the almost all of them over what, f about five dozen authors already engaged with agent. They were signed 
of, of the agent. And uh, it's a very slim picking for any translators to find the work. And uh, if the, uh, the author agrees with translator, but then agent is not, and uh, it, it's a disservice for the, um, you know, author. And uh, we've had, we've had many, many uh, good luck with working relationship, but same time when author involves with agent, then the relationship got suddenly like an uh, enemy, like it doesn't have to be that way. In Korea, some reason agent believe that, well, the, uh, their royalty is 10 to 12%. So US, they should give, what's the, uh, the price actually printed on the book? They get uh, 10 to 12% in Korea, whether that company, publishing company is about to be bankrupt or not. They get that. Um, so they stick with their belief, but in US, US very seldom they pay 10 to 12% of the printed price. And uh, especially, especially it's a new author. Nobody knows her. Who knows Kim Soon? There was only two, uh, two short stories. One is in England, I think last year called Divorce came out. And one was in Korea in Asia bilingual edition. And uh, also that uh, when we came all the way to third, number 32 publishers, and we do not have much choice of, you know, finding uh, the publisher to keep going. And uh, they demanded 10 to 12% of royalty from the university publisher. And uh, you've got to really adjust. And if you don't know, then listen to the people went through before but there was no such thing. That's why it took so long. You finally realize what we talk about and what we say does make sense. Some of authors get six figure uh, signing bonus, such as Kim An Su, the plotter. So lots of people probably think that, oh, this author get this much. How come she doesn't get this much? So that kind of uh, mindset. It's not going to work. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm mindful of the time now. So we have just under 13 minutes left, <laughs> uh, but this is, so I'm just going to quickly maybe uh, summarize uh, the key three questions. If you might be able to answer them, it's in relation to uh, the uh, one left. So the first one was uh, one that I, um, I read out before. So how, you know, have you received any feedback about the book from the victims themselves? And then second a question was um, in relation to the title. So uh, they thought that uh, the title was very powerful, the English title is very powerful and uh, self-explanatory yet uh, they, they were quite curious to know if um, why one left instead of one person, maybe uh, kind of remind us again, because you did mention that. But And then finally, um, there was a, and I'm afraid I don't have time to read it all out, but it's, uh, it's someone who, uh, based on their own experiences, uh, teaching on Korean comfort women was met with hostility, you know, from, from people. And they were just wondering if you have, you know, you as translators of Kim Sim's novels, has uh, met has been met with hostility from Koreans or organizations. Okay, first, first was we have not gotten feedback from the victims, and uh, we are uh, someday we are willing to visit that uh, foundation called Navi Foundation, which is Butterfly Foundation. I like to uh, uh, give their uh, give our book to them. Um, and uh, we have not gotten any hostility. However, on, uh, as Bruce mentioned that when Japanese media published the article and there was lots of uh, hostile, hostile comments, um, Korean media has been really mum, which is 
big question mark for us. Okay. As for as for the title of our translation, we have all along wanted to focus on the fact that Han Myung, literally one person, is a is a representation of over 200,000 other victims. But in the broader sense, it's a representation of all of those who have suffered, who have been dis-individualized in some way, who have been removed from historical memory, not just in Korea, not just in East Asia, but in the United States, all over the world. Uh, a, a month or so ago, Juchan and I were privileged to take place in an international literary event, I think called Litquake, uh, that was centered, one of the centers was in England. And the local sponsor of the event is African American. And at some point in our discussions, the uh, a historical atrocity that took place about 100 years ago in the state of Oklahoma came up and this was a basically a race riot which cost about 100 African Americans in the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma their lives and significant property damage as well. I remember hearing vaguely in, in a newspaper or a magazine account about this but uh, just as in the case of much larger scale tragedies, I uh, knew of this only as hearsay, as a vague historical event, and never thought of it in terms of the individuals who, who were involved. And so one left uh, obviously uh, resonates with the ending of the story in which only one of the registered how many remains alive. But it also reg regis registers very powerfully for us in the sense that each and every one of these 200,000 girls left home, left the ancestral home, left a family. And um, likewise, think of all the individuals who left their ancestral homes in what is now North Korea to come south. Think of all the individuals, every one of them who left what is now South Korea to go north. And recall that in the case of writers, it was not until the democratization of the political process in South Korea that these writers, these world book writers, these gone north writers, were restored to uh, to a public readership and to the attention of uh, academics. So one left, uh, obviously the, the protagonist, leaving her home at the age of 13, being taken away, multiply that by, by millions of people worldwide, and you have what, one of the one of my Asia four five seven students said a couple of nights ago in our final class that this novel is a call to arms, but not a call to arms in a combative uh, adversary sense, but a, I think a call to linking arms, mm -hmm. a, a reminder that we need to we need to try to overcome. These, uh, these historical differences that can, and cultural and racial and ethnic differences that continue, and, and political differences that continue to divide us and to, uh, and, and to remember that these are not some distant uh, historical events that remain in the past, but they continue to affect us today. So, mm -hmm. That's the, that's the thinking behind one left. Thank you very much. I think on that note, uh, we will formally end the Q&A sessions. I think that was all the questions. There were lots of good questions. And uh, Bruce and Chan, you've provided some very, um, uh, very good insight and uh, responses. So we, we very much appreciate and thank you for those. Um, so, um, 
there was one sort of chat comment, but I think that's, I think, Bruce and Jitan, you can have a look. It's in relation to thanking you for the event and uh, sort of, you know, pointing out that publishing can enlighten all of us uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the history and, and the realities and the like. Um, and um, so I think uh, we'll wrap up our uh, event this evening. But before we do that, I just wanted to make mention of, um, of uh, the, a forthcoming book, a publisher, uh, because it also relates to another one of our, uh, you know, highly regarded translators who sadly passed away in October. And that was um, uh, Kevin O'Rourke, uh, who was a Catholic a missionary, a Columban father, who, uh, who uh, from Ireland, um, went to Korea in the 1960s when he was yet in his 20s and devoted his lifetime in Korea, you know, translating poetry, fiction, teaching at Kyungi University. Um, and so, and um, Bruce uh, told me that, tells me that, so Kevin O'Rourke and Bruce uh, had planned a translation of collection of stories and uh, this was a couple years ago. I mean, it was in, uh, a couple years ago or so. And so they put forth a proposal for Penguin, Penguin UK, which was accepted. So um, the Penguin Book of Korean Short Stories is in the pipeline and uh, it will, it's forthcoming, um, hopefully will be published next year. Uh, but also just to you know, have this moment of commemorating uh, uh, Kevin O'Rourke. Um, who is no longer with us, but uh, he continues to live through his uh, translated works. And I was especially happy to hear about this, this new translation that we very much look forward to. And Bruce mentioned that it's not sort of just, you know, pieces that are for the sake of canonical anthology, but these are sort of personal pieces that between uh, Bruce and Kevin felt, you know, uh, deserved to be uh, gathered in this collection. So we very much look forward to that. And uh, we thank you both Bruce and Juchan very much um, for joining us and for sharing with us, you know, uh, the, and for, for your translation and, um, and also uh, they're joining us from nine hours time difference. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we very much look forward to, you know, uh, we've, we've been enjoying all your translations so far. We enjoy to future works and, uh, and for that, we are very grateful. So thank you very much again for joining us this evening. Thank, thank you Grace. so much, Grace. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank and you, thank everybody. You everyone. Yes, thank you everyone yeah. for joining this evening. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay.